Good morning, everybody. This is Chris Jones with the University of Arizona, Gila County Cooperative Extension. I want to uh, welcome you and invite you to today's uh, webinar, a program I call Garden and Country Extension Webinar Series. We have Marianne Capehart from uh, Cochise County, Sierra Vista here with us to talk about large scale water harvesting and small acreage and households. So Marianne, feel free to turn your camera on. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the uh, University of Arizona, these, these extension webinars. They are a weekly Zoom webinar, 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11 in Arizona. So please adjust your time zone if you're from out of state. Right now, if you're in California, you're all set with us. Uh, featuring a variety of horticultural and natural resource topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County and anywhere else in the world that would be interested in these programs. The recordings are posted at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. So I've got a playlist there called Garden and Country Extension. So just do that little search in YouTube. You can find all the old presentations. And the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. And that is my cue to do our um, affirmative action poll. So I'm gonna pull that up, launch that poll. Please take a moment to answer those three questions about your age, your gender, and ethnic group. We need to report this to our um, partners, and it is anonymous. Let me get back to my slides here. Today's agenda, thank you for everybody who joined a little early for the login and lag time. At 11 o'clock, we started. I'm Chris Jones, your moderator. Today's topic is large scale water harvesting for small acreage and households. Our speaker is Marianne Capehart. She has about a 30 minute presentation for us and we'll have a chat box discussion with Marianne at the end of that and finish up by noon here in Arizona. So thank you for being with us. And here is our presenter, Marianne Capehart. She's the instructional specialist with the uh, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension in the WaterWise program Cochise County, Sierra Vista. So with that, uh, welcome, Marianne. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Chris, for having me. This is great. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be able to talk today about one of my favorite uh, topics. Um, I work at the Cooperative Extension in Cochise County and, and we do a lot with uh, water conservation and including this topic, rain harvesting and gray watering and indoor conservation and um, xeriscaping and so forth, kind of like Chris does up here, um, a little more uh, very water focused. So anyway, today I have the pleasure of talking to you about uh, larger scale water harvesting. I'm gonna have three areas that I'm gonna cover. Um, one is the basics of rain harvesting, for those of you who aren't familiar with those. Uh, the second is, is going large, um, harvesting, a larger scale of rain harvesting to do um, more with it indoors. And the third is um, the basics of treating rainwater to make it drinkable. And so you can use it for your potable uses inside. So with that, I will share my PowerPoint. Those pictures are in Gila County. <laughs> That's a Simon's Hawk. <laughs> Just gotta make you feel at home for those of you there. Um, Thank you. So I thought I'd just throw this up just to get us thinking water. Um, which of these sources are uh, supply the water to the Gila County area? So we have precipitation, everybody knows that's rain, snow, sleet, hail, fog, etc. Storm water. Storm water is rain that's hit the ground and then runs across the ground and, and can be collected actually. Surface water, um, rivers, streams, brooks, uh, springs, and groundwater, water in underground in the aquifer, uh, and effluent, which is treated wastewater. So which one um, of these sources apply water to the Gila County area? If you're from that area, if not, forgive us, we'll just think about it in general. So um, all of them. Down in Cochise County, we have no surface water supply. 
So I, I'm, I really emphasize people uh, conserving groundwater and that may be true of where you're from if you're a groundwater dependent area. So you can see the, this is not new, but you can see kind of the breakdown. So you see effluent is not used very much, but it's a, it's a potential source of supply going forward. Um, so we're talking about including rainwater in supply on a, on a basis for people at home. And that rain can supply some of these needs. I won't go into them in any detail, but drinking, washing livestock and watering and cleaning, waste disposal, uh, septic and cleaning things. So uh, I'm gonna to refer to these two publications. Uh, they're wonderful publications that were made my predecessor at the WaterWise program and Cindy Wilkins, who is also working for the program. Um, so these are great publications for the basics. Um, so you might be able to throw a, a link up in the chat. Um, I will throw a link up for the other two I'm gonna talk about later, but these are wonderful uh, references. So I wanna just talk about the two types of rain harvesting is active and passive. Active is in tanks, so it's active because you're actually like putting it somewhere. You're making sure it goes where you want it uh, in a tank. Passive is when you kind of let the, the landscape absorb it on its own. Um, it's the cheapest way to do it. It's very efficient. Um, it can help your landscapes grow and be more um, vibrant. Oh, the other thing is you, why let it run off? Uh, I, I, we, we need to keep it on our, on our property. As I say, keep it on our side. Don't let run, water run off into the street, rainwater, um, which technically is storm water once it hits the ground. Um, it just gets dirty and goes nowhere in an arid climate. So these are uh, one picture of the basics. So um, roof, catchment area, got to get it on an impervious surface so we can direct it very easily to where we want it to go through gutters down pipes, um, then into a tank, and then into, um, if it's pressurized, and then to where you need it. Um, there's a, a first flush inverter there. I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail of that, but for the, for the rain, that's the first part of the rain that falls on a dusty roof, that might have had rain for a while, that dirty water goes into that pipe. And when it's full, it bypasses the full pipe and goes into a, a tank. You can see another water filter they have here. We don't use those too much these days, um, but those are pre-filtration tank there. I think you can see the clean out on the bottom that goes with the first flush, how you clean out the dirty water when it's done raining. And there is a picture of an overflow, also not uh, put in this drawing, very important every water system has to have an overflow in case the capacity of the system is exceeded by a lot of rain. You don't wanna just rushing out the top of the tank. You always wanna think about an overflow. And this one has a little critter catchers, catcher, so there's nothing crawling up and into the tank. So those are kind of the basics. Uh, there's the close up of that one. Nice big overflow. I like big pipes. Big pipes are good for rain harvesting. Get the water moving, um, go you know six inches or for gutters um, and large three or four inch pipes for the accessories to the tank. Uh, so this is in a, a publication um, we're gonna be talking about shortly. And this tells you um, the basics again. So you'll get familiar if you're not with the different parts of a rain harvesting system, um, the roof or catchment area. We'll talk about uh, other types of catchment besides a roof on a building. There's your first flash full of rain, it's blue, and it's being bypassed, goes into the tank three, there's your overflow. And then the outflow is on the bottom, goes over in this case to a pump and the treatment, which we'll talk about uh, the three components of, of safe treating for rain, safe treatment for rainwater. Oh, sorry, and so here we go, roof gutters, piping, tank or cistern, distribution piping and filtration treatment, so. You can remember those going forward if you're not familiar. Um, roofs. Uh, sometimes it can be complicated to gutter a roof properly for rain harvesting. So that's something you, you want to consider thinking about if you're going to install some rain harvesting, you need to put gutters up. Um, you know, you want to do the biggest area, the simplest way to do it. Um, it, can be, it can be a little tricky watching uh, the water flow and where, where it goes and how to direct the flow from the gutters to the tank. So that's kind of an issue. 
Uh, I like this picture. This is the Bisbee bath bathrooms of the Bisbee Historic Mining and Historical Museum. Um, they painted the gutter to match the brick. I thought it was clever. And that's into a, a cistern there. It's a culvert system. You don't see those cisterns as much anymore. Made from old culverts or new culverts. This is my humble grain harvesting system here in Bisbee, Arizona. Um, I decided uh, because of a slightly complicated roof profile, I would just do my garage. So I put up the gutter myself um, with the help of a friend, it goes down. Um, we had to go around the corner and then it goes into a 350 gallon tank, 1100 meter, uh, liters. And as a funny little funky overflow there, you see the top because that's what we had. I had those um, piping anyway, so I use those for a little overflow and it goes into a basin in a garden when, when, the, when the bank tank overflows and let's hope it does soon. Um, so that is the system that was quite easy to install. I got the tank in Mexico. Um, we try to you know, use what we have at home sometimes so we don't have to buy extra resources and make it as simple as possible. Um, so I don't want to belabor this too much, but there's two types of conveyance. So you know, when you were maybe planning what you want to do, one is uh, what we call wet and one is dry. Wet because the pipe underground that leads to the tank may be wet at certain times. Dry because it, it would not be dry. It's the just feeding water into the tank and uh, by gravity. They're both used by gravity to put water into the tank. The one on the left, you have to have a, what's called a head pressure of one or two feet. So the entrance to the gutter has to be higher than the entrance to the tank for that pressure to push the water down and up into the tank. Uh, this is good if you wanna put it away from the house or there's people walking uh, next to the building. You don't wanna have them walking under a, a downspout like that. So there's different ways to design these things. We do a lot of dry here down in, in, in my area. Um, so here are some nice large tanks. These are polyethylene tanks. These are what are being used most commonly at this point. Nice big pot, uh, pipes. You see your you see your inflow on the on the left. If you want to think briefly, is that a wet or a dry uh, system? If you said wet, you were right. Uh, it goes underground and up, and then you see a nice. Um, there's the overflow. Uh, in case the tank is completely full, you don't want to just spilling over the sides and you can also take that overflow. This is uh, to a, a useful place that that water is being used as well. This one just kind of goes out on the left. Um, and you can't really see the outflow on the left, but you can see it on the right. It goes into a very nice pump, it's a beautiful system on the right. Here is a, a dude in Bisbee. He decided that he has lots of beautiful rain harvesting. This um, gentleman was a uh, fireman. Nice, uh, beautiful fittings. He decided to go large with his pipes, which I agree with. Um, and there's a quick release fitting there where he puts a pump, a transfer pump and pumps it uphill to another tank. And then that feeds his garden with um, gravity. And then he just puts the pump away. Um, and so he decided he wanted to drink rain. He didn't, wasn't real pleased about what he saw in the city water. And, and there's potential in the city water for what we call emerging contaminants. And so he's like, let me drink my rain. So he takes it out and he takes it a little treatment system on his porch um, and drinks it and uses it for cooking. Um, that's another system down below with four polyethylene tanks. And this is a smaller system for a garden um, on the upper right in Bisbee. We have a rain harvesting tour that we'd love to invite you to if you're in the area. Um, not right away, but we sh we're hoping to have them again soon. Uh, this is a cool tank, kind of like a water tower you'd see in a city. Uh, underground cisterns, um, we'll talk about an example of that later. They're kind of like just really swimming pools under underground. This one has a liner, so that's going large. Uh, they're modular ones. So you don't have to, to pour cement, but they have a very large liner. Um, these are also underground tanks. Um, underground tanks are harder to maintain um, if there's a leak uh, or a problem or you need to clean them, but they are out of the way and you can use the space on the surface for something else. These IBC totes are great. Um, you can get them used. They were, you know, for uh, food grade, they're food grade. So you can, um, 
this guy hooked them up together. So they're one system. And there's his uh, first flush on the right. So that fills up first. It's very, very efficient system. You can buy a lot of gizmos out there for water harvesting, but um, it's actually pretty simple. Here's a, an idea to use a horse trough. You have to cover it so because of evaporation. We have actually a plan for this on the WaterWise website. It's a nice overflow. Uh, here's some smaller tanks. You wanna start small, it's great. Um, get some barrels. You can also use food grade barrels. Um, great for house plants. If you know, you'll run out quickly. This is 55 gallons. Most people use, you know, ideally 40 gallons themselves a day, but awesome for house plants. And I still have some in mind. Uh, my couple of barrels out there, I'm hoping they'll last till the monsoon. Um, so we have a lot of tanks in Cochise County. We had a wonderful grant um, and it was the Cochise Water Project. So uh, tanks of all sizes and descriptions um, funded. We have a small mini grant. If you're in Cochise County, let me know if you're a business or an institution. Um, so yeah, you can see the modular tank up on the left and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Those are, um, really great options. They've gotten a lot cheaper. They're steel modular tanks. Okay, so yeah, some people would just, you know, wanna keep it simple, gravity fed irrigation. It will go slow. It will go slower as the tank lowers because there's less, what I mentioned earlier, head pressure, um, but that is an option. And um, if you want, you can uh, of course pressurize it and you can also use gravity by using your elevation. So you can see that drip systems even um, need some pressure. So you don't get a lot from a tank, but um, you can let it out very slowly and gradually. Yeah. Don't get into too much detail. This kind of thing is also in the um, irrigation handouts we have at the cooperative extension. I'll show you where that website is. Here are some options for pumping. One goes in the tank. Uh, the transfer tank that I mentioned with the gentleman from Bisbee who moves his water uphill um, and then just takes it off and then an external pump, I think we saw one of those. This is an example of one of the external pumps. Now this pump was eventually covered in a box. It's just kind of out there right now, beautiful pump. Goes up to um, uphill to a, a lot of spigots that water uh, native plant garden there. Um, people all, often ask, are worried about the quality of rainwater. Um, if it's properly what we call pre-filtered, which means the filtration that comes before you put it in a tank, it can be quite clean and last very well if it is A, light tight and B, critter tight, mosquito tight and other critters, so nothing's getting in there. And that this is uh, five-year-old water. Um, these are also in the publications that I'm recommending, um, but you know, you can get an idea of like, oh, what's my garage or what's my house? Um, how much could I get? So this is kind of the fancy one, but you basically are just taking 60% of the square footage of your roof. And that is the gallons for an inch of rain. So if you have a roof, you can just say, oh, 60% of, of my a thousand square foot roof is 600. Um, and so roughly I'll get 600 gallons in an inch of rain. Of course, you know, we could put some efficiency factors, you know, wind might blow some of it off. Maybe your gutter overflowed in a big range, you're not gonna get all of it. There are, there are other things, if you wanna be more conservative, you can um, take a portion of that saying, not all of it is gonna make it into the tank. Go in large. Um, I, I'm gonna show you the two uh, publications I wrote recently and presented them at the um, uh, American Rain Catchment Association, Systems Association. Um, because I read an article and it was about a fella who had lost uh, his well because of declining water table levels that are prevalent in quite a few areas in the state. Uh, that are not protected by our um, regulation. So uh, water is pretty much just free for the taken. So they, he mentioned that he would either have to sell or he would have to haul water. Uh, this is a picture of a guy hauling, hauling water for a neighbor. 
And I was like, ah, oh, what, what about larger scale grain harvesting? Uh, I just uh, want people to have that as an option, as part of the conversation, at least. Um, something to be considered, if not for everything that you need, at least for a portion to supplement uh, maybe what you have with an underperforming well, or if you're hauling water, you can add it to that water and combine them. So um, I, I actually called this journalist and said, hey, let's talk about uh, larger scale rain harvesting as an option. Um, these are the two publications that I wrote regarding that. So one is basically a guide of how to like come to the decision to, to do a larger scale um, installation. And the other is um, I did with, these are both uh, collaborations, one with um, a, a wonderful um, policy thinker and writer and rain harvester, Susan Eden, the Water Resources Research Center, and the other, um, a and herself, and the other, a um, water uh, expert, um, water quality expert, and um, retired now, Yannick Artiola. So as I mentioned, um, one of the reasons I, I feel a, very passionate about encouraging larger scale rain harvesting, and I know you're thinking we didn't have rain this year if you live in Arizona, or maybe you had sparse, very sparse rain wherever you are, maybe you had great rain, um, but I don't think we should give up yet um, on a, a decent monsoon um, and um, the possibility of, of still grabbing this rain when it comes and keeping it so you can use it so these are, this is a map you can look at at the Arizona Department of Water Resources where some wells have gone dry. And it's, it's, a, it's a concern for people who can't afford to drill a, another well or even deepen their well. Um, so yes, they would have to have some money to install rain harvesting, but the costs are um, not much cheaper going uh, in, the, in the initial installation, but much cheaper going forward. Um, so here you see a plummeting groundwater level in the Cochise County next to a, a large agricultural enterprise. It's 200 feet. So you can, you can look at these well records uh, if you live in Arizona and want to look on the Arizona um, Department of Water Resources well. They have a, a site with wells. It's an interactive map. Uh, here are the hot spots and some of the hot spots in the in the state with losing um, groundwater levels sometimes below what people have with their wells. Um, so these are reasons to go large. Um, I mentioned the water table. Uh, some your well is still working but not great. Um, you know finances. Um, trucking water can be like three hundred dollars a week. It depends. Um, some people prefer rainwater. They like the taste. They like its softness. Um, it's great for cleaning. It's great for plants. Plants like it too, for the same reasons we do, because it has less minerals and it, it just it absorbs more easily for plants. And um, actually, an overabundance of minerals can be difficult for people as well, especially babies and elderly. So these are the things you have to think about if you were gonna go large. Um, of course, the size of your catchment, uh, the rainfall in your area, and these, you know, talking about average rainfall is a tricky subject these days because we are in a drought uh, in the Southwest. Um, we have declining precipitation overall, um, but we also have higher temperatures, so we're getting more evaporation, so in a sense, um, harvesting rain into a tank is a pretty good policy because it doesn't evaporate. Then you can use it on your landscape. Um, so the rainfall used typically is 30 years. I'm questioning whether that's a good, a good way to look at average rainfall because you want to have some idea of how much you're going to be able to harvest. You can always go for an inch. What would just an inch be? And then you build up from there. You calculate the inch first then multiply it by how many inches you might think you have a year. Um, so um, there are, are many places to see your average rainfall. Um, you can look just for the last couple of years. Storage size, of course, you can't sort of capture more than you can store uh, for active rain harvesting. And then how much do you use? So those factors have to toggle together 
view to design a system or decide to design a system. So you can add roofs. So if you don't have a big enough roof, you're thinking I live in a tiny house or I live in a small home, um, a trailer um, or a double wide or, or whatever it is, it's not, not huge. Um, you can add roof areas quite easily. The top one on the left is um, done with recycled materials. People say, why didn't they put it above the ground? It could store cars in it, could have, but these were the posts that he had. Uh, there's another one. So these are, um, roofing just nailed to a, a wooden frame um, at a slope going into a gutter and then down a pipe to storage. And there's one on the bottom. This is our part of our uh, off the grid tour we have down in Cochise County. Um, so if you can get the big enough roof, then you can get, you can add storage if you can afford or you can build it up gradually. So we have different options of storage here. The one on the bottom is a um, um, ferro-cement tank uh, with a ga rock gabion on the outside to support it, uh, built by two people by hand with local soil. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and the one next to that, the, the green tanks, they, they, um, they have a lot of different tanks, but they, they put them all together, do uh, a great job of um, existing on rain alone. Here's some rainfall. This is in the publication. Um, so you can look at each month and what demand. So you can calculate demand. I, I, I make some suggestions here for sort of lowering demand. Compost toilet, you know, also just, you know, when it's yellow, let it mellow. Don't flush every single time is another option. So there's ways to work to get your your usage down to the point where you can calculate how much you could save in that tank and then how much you would use over time. And you don't have to have the tanks to store your whole year usage because you'll use some of it and it will refill hopefully in the winter rains for our bimodal rainfall in here in Arizona. Um, and so you can calculate, okay, I'm gonna, have, I have this much roof, it, it, it yields this much water, I can store this much. And then, um, you know, how much will I be using per day and how will that go over time um, for a year is a good way to look at it. Knowing that your tanks will be emptied and refilled at some point during that year. Uh, you can also calculate plant demand. Um, there are ways to do that. Um, so, or you just, you know, use it up till it's gone knowing that you gave them that lovely rain until it's gone and then you'll use your groundwater again. Um, so this is the calculation for a veggie garden. So that was 27, almost 2,800. So you'd, you know, you could have a tank, not even that big and be like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a lot of my watering with rain. Um, so I have several examples um, I wanna talk about in, uh, that are that are actually mentioned in that publication. Um, I should maybe when I'm done, I'll put the little link to these publications in the chat. So uh, this groundwater is prohibitive for a well. Uh, it's too low. It's at 3,600 feet below ground. So they put in these th these tanks. Uh, it's a great system. Um, and then did a settling tank sort of to settle out some of the debris. So that was one way to what we do, what we call pre-filtration, which is before it goes to the tank. Thank so it's filtered before the tank. Um, it's a great system. And this is the same one. And you see that it goes, this is before they backfilled around the tanks on the left. And then there's the system, which is in the basement of this home. And you see the, various components of the system um, and the um, ladder there, pressure tank. Oh, and then, and then you can kind of see the uses. So there, this system is, if, if you capture everything that's available for an average year of rain, they exist around 33 gallons per person per day. So there's a wide variety of use of, of, of water by people per day. I, the rain harvesters, because they're conscious of their rain, it's not just coming out of the tap, 
or the well, and they're not metering their wells, so they don't really know what they, how much they're using, uh, you know, have a pretty good idea. So they um, tend to be quite good at conserving water. And it seems they hover around 30 to 40 gallons per person per day. So yeah, this is another home in, near Flagstaff. Um, they're actually not on city water. So they have this big underground tank and there is their treatment down there. Uh, this is a homestead that uh, has a tiny house. So they had the, the picture I showed earlier of the rain roof um, uphill. The water came down and entered these four cisterns. So they never had a well. Um, they went large. This is a beautiful building constructed for um, like a gym workshop, vehicle shelter and various functions goes into a nice big tank on the left with a pump house next to it. And that's one of these modular tanks that put up in the morning. Um, I, I believe it was around $13,000, but you know, discount might've happened just because, you know, I'm not, I don't want you to quote that, that, that amount of money, but it's a, it's a really large tank and uh, it's gonna oversupply what they need for the year. Then there's their treatment in the bottom. This is Handyman, Derek Handyman Howlett. He has a web a YouTube channel with many, many videos, if you haven't checked him out, um, explaining everything that he's done on this property. It's amazing. So he's done a beautiful job setting up this rain harvesting system. And it, the pre-filtration is really just the screen uh, on the top of the tank as it enters the tank is all the pre-filtration is, but um, he has um, very, very good treatment. This is a, a man, a gentleman who lives outside of Tucson. Uh, the groundwater there was awful. They, they couldn't drink it. Um, they wouldn't drink it. So they put in a, basically an underground swimming pool. Um, he's been living off this water exclusively for, uh, I think it's 15 years now. Um, they actually could get the, uh, the bank to agree to have that expense in the mortgage, which was great. Um, and then they have, these are biologists. Uh, they have very intense uh, filtration. So I'm gonna talk about what's necessary. Um, they, they kind of went above and beyond, but, but that's great. Um, uh, kind of pioneering some of this stuff. So, um, I, I called, uh, this is Jay Cole, wonderful guy, actually gives tours of the system. I met him at the Water Resources Research Center. I said, how are you doing? Um, out of the four examples I give in this publication, I, I reached two of them and they were fine. They were gonna make it through the year with their rain, um, you know, being quite conservative, of course. One of them has got, had to turn to hauled water uh, and another one I couldn't reach, but um, I asked him how he was how he was doing with that. And Jay said, um, it's okay. We've, you know, we've gotten through really low periods, but we're using about um, 45 gallons per person per day. Uh, we're concerned about this mega drought. Um, so we increased our conservation. This is what they did. They canceled their vegetable garden. They use paper plates, which is you know, kind of intense. Um, and they run the dishwasher only once a week. Uh, they really try to cut down on their clothes washing, uh, shorter showers. They don't give cistern water to the birds outside. He said they um, buy bottled water for them, um, share a flush, and um, you know, just extremely good with like turning off the, the tap while you're brushing your teeth and rinsing. Don't leave the dishes, uh, rinse, soak and rinse the dishes without leaving the tap on between scrubs. So they have about 11,500 gallons in their cistern. So they're hoping monsoon hits and, and they'll, they'll make it through. Um, here is their um, setup. They actually have a pool too, which is supplied by rain. So that's just something they've, they've just budgeted for with that big tank underground. Uh, here is the uh, ferro cement, hand-built ferro cement tank, um, quite large. 
Um, so this is fairly new. So we'll see how they have fared this year. Um, they also have a, a large rain roof, I think is one of the pictures in the background. Um, so they built an extra roof and a very large porch because they live in, in um, very small homes. So they can increase their capacity. So they're quite, what they're living on is quite low. It's 22 gallons per person per day. I mean, you can go big, you can go big. You, there's, a, there's a point at which you can't harvest rain if you're gonna use 182 gallons a day or something. If you just got like crazy stuff going on, um, you will not be able to harvest rain. So I, I just wanna make it clear that you, you can get good amounts, um, but you can't get the highest, the high, highest users cannot live on rain. Sorry. Uh, here's a couple, they built uh, their system. Um, they're off grid in every way and uh, kind of built it up gradually and have a beautiful system. She actually used to just drink the rain straight. And he moved in and said, let's do some filtration. Um, so you can see their tank there. So their roof is about 2,600 square feet. Uh, the, this is the 18 uh, average rainfall. They have this collection of storage tanks that are connected. Um, they have a home, they have a, a garage. And um, they have to use it as it, ha as it comes because they can't store all of the potential. But they, they, they rely on it solely for all of their needs. Um, did I, yeah, so those are kind of the larger, how to, how to think about large scale rain harvesting um, regarding a uh, comparison between a well, if you didn't have a well and a um, large scale rain harvesting system. I did a, a cost comparison. Um, so this has been, uh, it was 2020. So, you know, prices change, some go down, some go up and they came out kind of equal. Um, so this was Cochise County, drilling costs may be different in other, are most likely different in other places. So it's interesting though, it, it kind of came up equal for the cost, but to maintain a well and have to replace a pump for instance is very expensive. Um, both of them might need some water treatment. Um, with the um, rain you have to treat uh, absolutely because of the, um, microbes that might come from bird droppings and so forth on the roof. So let me make it super clear, you have to treat rainwater to drink it. And drought, so I'm gonna, I think I'm running out of time, but I wanna go briefly that um, if you can't just survive on rain, you can make a combination of, of several things. You can combine it with trucked in water, or you can combine it with a low performing well, which a lot of people have done. Unfortunately, they have, two ways of getting into the home. It's best if you can combine them, treat them and put it into the home. And then- Marianne, you, you have time, don't feel rushed. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's ways to, to uh, counter drought, still using your lovely rain. Okay, so uh, as I said, lovely rain. Rain is generally um, a high quality water. Um, it has a slightly um, neutral pH compared to um, the alkaline the alkalinity of a lot of groundwater in the Southwest. And it doesn't have things that might have collected in groundwater from various uh, sources of uh, pollution um, from farming runoff, or someone's septic tank nearby uh, overflowing, um, other, uh, I'm not even gonna compare it to city water because that's a whole other um, deal when you're drinking things that have come from maybe pharmaceuticals and so forth. Um, on the other hand, it's also um, a hungry water and it does absorb things. Uh, you, you know, you heard of acid rain, it's absorbing sulfur dioxide. And um, 
the slight acidity has to be handled, handled so it's not like corroding things. Uh, even a cement tank, you have to throw some slate in there to offset that slight acidity. So uh, those are the kind of differences. Um, it depends on where you are. Uh, on the, in a nice, in a rural area, uh, we're fortunate enough not to have a lot of traffic, so we don't have a lot of um, particulate from from vehicles. And um, there, uh, there's a lot of dust, and there is some mining activity. Um, so um, those can contribute um, to things in the in the air that will turn into dust on the roof, um, and then of course whatever is running up on, on the roof. But um, in general, we think of it as a very, very nice water. Here are the two publications. Um, I'm gonna try to throw that up in the, in the chat. Uh, here are some more um, things that you frequently find in groundwater. Um, so uh, rain will not have those. Um, unless there are things you have in your installation that might be contributing, say for instance, lead flashings. So you have to be careful of what is in your system. Um, and, and you can test your rainwater as well as you would well water every year um, to see initially what, what might be turning up. Um, but then again, what we wanna do is actually treat for all of it. Um, so we have a thorough treatment. Um, and here it goes. So this is the recommended treatment um, by uh, the Cooperative Extension, University of Arizona. I know Texas AgriLife also has the same components. So we have the pre-filtration, which I mentioned. Some people have, you have the roof washer, uh, first flush. Um, you might, you have a very fine grade screen at the entrance to your tank if it's a dry delivery. Um, and so there's various things that you can do. You clean your gutters, you keep the leaves out, you can, you know, sweep off the roof. Um, that's pre-filtration. And then you want to make sure, yes, that you're not getting a lot of things in your tank. And I'm sorry, in your pump. So after it's being pumped, you can um, put it through with a three-prong um, filtration and treatment. So first the, the cartridge sediment filters, you wanna get out any little sediment, any little rust particles or tiny, very fine dust. Um, so you filter, it, you filter it through a, a paper cartridge sediment filter, rated quite small, those are pore sizes. So, um, it gets anything that size or above out. And then a uh, carbon filter takes out odors and other things that's, that's rated quite small as well. Um, fil these filters have to have uh, their filters changed on a schedule. And I mentioned that in the publication. And then for all the sort of microbes and giardia and these um, living things, you zap it with ultraviolet radiation and that uh, lamp has to be changed as well. So it's part of the expense and maintenance, uh, but some people prefer to save electricity and the cost of replacing the bulbs and do ceramic candle filters. And then if you're worried about anything that might be particular to your area or your ex ex actual system, or you're just very vigilant um, or have health issues, you can do reverse osmosis for the drinking portion of your water. You don't have to do it for the whole house. Um, that's probably overkill for most people in rain treatment. So yeah, here's the pre-filtration, some of the things I mentioned, um, and then you wanna filter it enough so it's not gonna mess up your pump if you do have high level of particulates coming off out of your tank. Um, and here is a three-prong method again. So on the left, you can see it coming in up to the pressure tank, to the cartridge filter, the carbon filter, and the UV. 
or they have an extra set of, um, no, those are filters waiting to be installed. Yeah, no. So it's a, it's a wonderful method to make sure that if you are harvesting rain, that it will be healthy, drinkable, and up to drinking water standards, if not above. EPA drinking water standards. Here's another one. This one's a little different. Um, they use, instead of a five micron, they're using a 10, um, and then a five ac activated carbon filter. So people, you know, people do things differently. They live in different situations. Uh, their water might be a little different. The gentleman with the settling tank outside of Williams, Arizona uh, has such clean water going in that he doesn't use a activated carbon filter at all. And there's, there's other options. There's lower cost options. Um, there's um, the ceramic filters. I know Master Rain Harvester Brad Lancaster uses one of these. Um, they were made by Potters for Peace. They're, they're pretty awesome, colloidal silver and in a ceramic uh, earthen um, jar, basically. Um, and then down below, this is um, for earthships. So this is one of the designs they use for earthships. So you can see a little pump there, um, nothing expensive, half a horsepower. Um, they have these spin down candle, I mean, these spin down filters, which are basically sediment filters of different degrees. Sometimes the earth ship, the water's coming right off the roof. So there's a, quite a bit of sediment in it. I mean, yeah, it's like the roof goes like into the tank. It's, it's, there's no like barrier practically. Um, and then you have the, the, um, tank, the um, I'm sorry, the pressure tank. And then you have a candle filter, a five candle filter, which are just um, many, many, many pores. The water goes is forced through all very thin pores in a very circuitous route, uh, kind of like a Berkey works. And then it um, gets everything out to about 99 point something percent. Okay, so these are, you know, some of the things that people think about when they think about rain, they're like, oh my God, drought, uh, precipitate variability. It's not always gonna be the same every year. And it's not gonna come up when you maybe necessarily think it's gonna come. Um, the upfront costs are considerable, but they get cheaper as, as they go forward. It's very much less expensive to replace a pump suitable for rain harvesting than it would be for a well pump. Um, so, and of course, drilling deeper if your water table level is falling is very expensive. I think that uh, I talked to someone in Coconino County that she said she was thinking that most um, rain harvesting systems for potable supply are between 15 and $30,000. Okay. Who do you think is doing well in this area? Is it Hawaii, Texas, Virgin Islands, or Arizona? You ready? Virgin Islands. Uh, Hawaii. I know a lot of people just use above ground swimming pools in Hawaii. Texas had incredible drought quite a while ago, quite early. So they, they got a lot of rain harvesting set up. And then us, Arizona, or at least some of us. All right, that is pretty much all I have to say at this point. Um, love to take questions. Excellent, thank you so much, Marianne. Uh, I appreciate that we were able to get through those extra slides. I think that was more stuff we wanted to know. And if people are serious about this, those options for filtration are so important. Um, we've got some questions in the, in the Q&A and the chat. So if you've got more questions, feel free to put those in there. I'm going to stop the recording at noon as usual. So we'll do a little closeout, but hang out as long as you want to talk with Marianne, as long as she's willing to stay with us. And we'll just get through all your questions. Um, one thing to look for in the chat, I did put uh, the links to Marianne's extension bulletins in there for choosing large scale water harvesting potable supply and preparing rainwater potable use. So those are available in the links. I got those for you. And at the top, I'm gonna put this in here one more time, the uh, webinar evaluation link, which helps me out with 
reporting what I'm doing and all that. So get, give me a new idea of what we want to do. So let me jump into uh, the, the Q&A here. Would you like me to read them? No, I'll read these to you and you answer the question. So Peter's asking, has anyone in Cochise County done potable water using slow sand filters? I have not found anyone yet. I would like to find someone. I know someone wants to explore that option because it's low tech and um, affordable, but um, no, I have not met anyone thus far, but I'm gonna look now. Okay, good. <laughs> And a, and a question from Judine, she says, uh, what resources are there to get more information about laws regarding the collection of rainwater? Can we collect within the city? So I'm, I don't know if you know who Judine, which city she lives in, but go ahead. There's um, a lot of cities have opened up to rain harvesting now. And even the problem that people had in Colorado has been resolved if you're harvesting uh, not from a, a huge structure. So in general, there's, there's not a lot of problems with legality. Um, you, of course, always need to check with your county. Um, in uh, this county, uh, we don't have to uh, per get permitted for putting in a rain harvesting system. And um, that would be county by county or city by city. I don't know which city we're speaking about, but if it's Tucson, you're good to go. Same with Phoenix. Great. And Tom is asking, close to the beginning, close to the beginning, I think there was mention of not having surface water collection in Cochise County. Is there a regulation against that? Um, what I was speaking about in the beginning was um, where our water supply comes from. And um, there's just, there, we're not pulling water for people and industry and businesses to use off of the San Pedro River or its tributaries. Um, people, you're not, it's not legal to divert water off of a wash of a certain size either. So, um, Cochise, no, it's not, Cochise, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, Cochise County doesn't have any major reservoir and Wilcox Playa just doesn't hold that much water anymore after no. what, five, 10,000 years. Okay. So, um, then People feel, feel free to go ahead and put some questions in here if you got them. I'm gonna ask you, Marianne, to slip on back to a slide where you showed um, kind of annual rainfall or water requirement for a small garden. And just that idea of, uh, I, I often look at, depending on where we live, if we're using harvested rainwater as much as we can for our, uh, landscape and gardening, that takes a lot of pressure off of groundwater. And so just want to get a sense of how small can we actually go? It was, it was a table that was kind of yellow, beige colored. That one, there we go. Okay. Yes, I did this with our, our plant demand calculator. I don't know if you use those, Chris. Um, uh -huh. And it it's, um, has local evapotranspiration rates. And so, this is, yeah, this is how this looks. So these, these demands that you've got here, our evapotranspiration rates are very low in January and February and start to pick up into June until the monsoon's supposed to come. And so uh, are these total demand edibles, are those gallons? Yes. Okay. So if we were to make it through the hard portion of May and June, thinking maybe we got enough run in, a in April to fill up a tank. Yeah. If we had approximately a 750 gallon tank that may or may not, but, but should be able to handle a uh, hundred square feet of beds. Because mm -hmm. we're gonna get rain at other times, it's gonna fill up our tank, but May and June tend to be super dry and that'd be the biggest demand. Yeah. So, yeah. so what do you think of that? Cause that's, that's to me, like you're saying, 55 gallon drums, it's nice, it's easy but it just doesn't last very long. So no. a 750 gallon tank, that seems like a nice household type of tank. I was just thinking yeah. what's practical, you know, a person has a 1200 square foot roof or 1500 square foot roof. They can get, and it depends on where we live. If we're in Yuma, you're gonna need a lot of 
storage and way to be able to keep it from evaporating. Yeah. But those of us on the eastern side of the state where we have a better signal for the monsoon and winter rains, um, we can get 12, 15 inches of rain per, per year on average. I just wanted to get an idea of what you think about it. Size of the yeah, tank. I mean, we, we often say harvest for the monsoon. So that would be down here, that'd be like two thirds of our annual rainfall. Um, so that depending on the roof size, it'd be nice to get that, you know, to get that monsoon rain, but not get every scrap of the of, of inches mm -hmm. the year round, but to shoot for that is a sort of more affordable way. To, but from the demand side, yeah, um, a nice, you know, thousand gallon tank. Um, I think that's ideal, they're, yeah. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're about, and when they get a little bigger, they're about 62 cents a gallon for a tank. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's a great plan. Or you can have two, you could have IBC totes that one guy had, what were those two forties, four of them lined up. Um, he's someone who has other tanks. And then he has this little pump that he pumps things across his garage into the IBC totes so he can collect and let that first tank fill up again. They kind of consolidates his various satellite tanks into this main tank area. Good. Okay. So Peter responds back. Do you think I would get any pushback from the county if I try slow sand filters? He wants to try it. So if you know, you recognize Peter's name. Yeah. Well, Peter, you get in touch with Marianne, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we can give that a shot. You're not going to get pushback from the county or uh, for 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 rain harvesting installations like that. Okay. So Teresa is asking, what kind of funding- Please call any, me. I'd love yeah. to. And, um, Teresa is asking, what kind of funding, if any, might be available for a 25,000 gallon or so tank for the Cochise County homestead and large garden small farm? So any support to do something like this that you're aware of? Where is the farm? Cochise County. We have, I have um, mini grants, we call them, they're $2,000, but you have to be in the Sierra Vista sub watershed of the San Pedro River. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, I don't know of rebates at this point for um, farms, but I might not be the best person to know that. Um, so please contact me, I can, I can send you off to the right person. Um Peter is coming back saying, are you actually growing veggies in January? Which is yes, winter gardens work throughout a great portion of Arizona. Okay. Uh, so, and I've got several webinars on those winter gardens and we're gonna have some more coming up. So awesome. um, winter and gardens, have I was gonna say my, speak, my speaker is from Payson. So even higher elevations, you can have a winter garden. Go ahead, Marianne. And you have another, you have another uh, thought regarding rainwater coming. Mm -hmm. which... Right, we had a, uh, we had a big uh, water harvesting project in the state with a researcher from the University of Arizona by the name of Dr. Monica Ramirez. And um, she was really looking at contaminants in rainwater, did a lot of uh, testing of, of all that water over two and a half, three years she's going to come back with this online tool that you can look at what happened. And so uh, I felt think the um, results are pretty encouraging. Um, great study, yeah. Okay, Shelly is asking, can you show the slide with the different water basins again? My well in the Wallapai Basin has dropped over 60 feet in the past two years, as of two years ago. I believe this was a Nature Conservancy talk. Uh, if you look on their website um, that I took this slide from, it was Nature Conservancy talk. So this would be a good place for you to look for more information about that. So no, that's a, I'm sorry, that's a big decline. Yeah, that's twice what you have there. So I'm sure that's why she's asking. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And that's as of 2019. And this is 2021, so that's two years since. So hopefully they're still monitoring that. Yeah, there's index wells. You can look on the index wells 
to see one that's close to your house to see what's happening. That's the wells they use to measure groundwater. Okay. Um, um, I, we still have several questions for you, Marianne. We're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and just shut down the, the video. Please, if you're here live, stay here. We're going to answer your questions, but I'm going to just close this down right this time. Okay, so you can see Marianne here on the slide. And so thank you very much, Marianne. We really enjoyed your presentation. I think the group here is really engaged. Um, we have been going through our question and answer discussion. Great questions, help you, happy to help out with all this. And just to let you know, next week we'll be back Thursday, June 24th at 11 a.m. I've got Willie Somers. He's the Invasive Plant Program Coordinator at the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. And the topic is challenges and opportunities for managing invasive plants in Arizona. So hopefully you can come back and join us and fun. great having you all with me today. Um, Thank you, Chris. Have a, have a good day, you're welcome.